Good morning, everybody. And uh, well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, because you are connecting from different parts of the world. So I hope you're all doing well, staying safe, staying strong, staying healthy, and uh, you know, doing as best as you can do in the middle of all these circumstances that we are all going through. And that's, it's become a, a little bit of a tradition for me this past uh, two or three weeks to, to, bring, to bring great guests to have conversations about what's going on right now, how to get ready, how to cope with all that's happening, but also think a little bit about what's going to happen after the crisis that we're going through. I know that probably 95% of, of all our mental and our emotional bandwidth right now is dedicated to the day-to-day, -day, right? If we, if we think about home, it is about, you know, children. It is about making sure that everything is, is going well at home. It is about staying safe and staying healthy. And when it comes to work, it is about doing the job or making sure that our organizations are able to survive through this very, very complicated period that we are all going through. But the 5% that remains, it's, it's not too much, but it's, it's, I want to make sure that we are filling it up with a lot of great ideas because we are going to get through this. We're going to get out of this. And in the day after tomorrow, when we have resolved the complexity of the coronavirus, we are going to have a lot of work to do to reframe part of the work that we have, we have been doing before to do things differently and hopefully better. So I am hoping that we are helping you think through some of the uh, some of the things that you have to do through the crisis, but at the same time, helping you think about what's going to happen after we get over coronavirus. So I'm, I'm very excited to talk to Janelle, the uh, CEO and co-founder of Anuvia. And I'm going to tell you how this conversation started. Janelle and I were uh, chatting via email and she shared with me some data from their uh, latest research that was a little scary. And I got to say, it was shocking to me to see some of the data, which you, you may think it is, it is evident, but when you see it in numbers, you, you know, it's mind blowing. So Janelle will be sharing some of that, some strategies and some long-term strategies as well. So Janelle, thank you so much for joining uh, me in this interview today. How are you doing? Doing well. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Absolutely. It is, a, it is an honor to have you. And uh, is, is family doing well? Everything is going well, you know, in yeah. any of the circumstances? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so me, my, my husband, my three uh, boys, nine, seven, and six, um, and also my dad, um, we're all hunkering down together at our home, in our home and uh, trying to make the best of the situation. Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm glad that... Um, that, you know, families together and you're all safe and healthy and, uh, and of course, at the same time, doing all the amazing work that you're doing. Um, you. So tell me more a little bit about you, about Anuvia, and then we're going to, you know, sort of dive right into the, the conversation of the data and some of your ideas for short-term coping strategies from the organizational perspective and also what to do long-term. So, um, you know, share with us a little bit about you and, and Anuvia as well. Yeah, sure. No, no problem. So, Anuvia is the first activist investment management firm um, that's really dedicated and focused on getting more out of the diversity and inclusion programs that corporations are executing now. Um, so we actually believe and know um, that corporations that embrace diversity and inclusion and have cultures that do that perform better from not only a business perspective, but from a stock perspective. Mm -hmm. And so we invest in those corporations and then we are actively engaged with those corporations to, to giving them, let's say, supporting them and asking them to do even more. Um, so we focused for the last almost two years exclusively on gender equity mm -hmm. um, and really looking at the C-suite and the board level and trying to uptick those numbers. So if we have corporations that have one or 15% of their um, management teams are female, um, we actually want them to go further, push over the 25 and 30% mark on both of those. And we see that returns and business outcomes improve. Um, so we also kind of look at the crisis and, and areas that are triggers for big change to understand how we can play a role in society, um, addressing either policy um, implications and how they impact diverse groups differently, um, and, and that's actually where this study came, right? So 
when um, the COVID crisis came intuitively um, as a executive from large corporations, now obviously an entrepreneur, um, I understood that working from home and, and homeschooling children wasn't going to be possible. Um, I also intuitively understood that most of the colleagues that were in um, kind of C-suite succession um, were also in a similar position as me. They have children. Um, and so now they were going to be balancing full-time jobs and children. Um, but I, I'm very keenly aware that executives want data. Yeah. Right. So moving the uh, moving um, the needle in large corporations with intuition doesn't work, but data does. So we sought the voice. Right. We asked ten questions, pretty simple questions, just to get to the top level level of um, the issue. Uh, looking for women that worked in corporations with more than fifty people, because I think you know even these smaller firms have different challenges than the large ones and trying to understand what's going on and what, what, what's happening. Right. And so with that reached out to a few people in my network, um, put this study on, you know, on social media and surprisingly was able to get about 150, just over 150 in two days. And um, we're getting close to 200 as I've left the survey open so that women can feel heard. I've, I've heard, um, I've gotten feedback from several of the uh, women that have taken the, the survey that even just taking that helped help them feel better. Yeah, and we're gonna talk a little bit about what the survey says. But before, <laughs> Janelle, I want to tell you uh, some of the people, wh where they are connecting from so that you have an idea of uh, what the global audience right now is. We have people from Croatia, New Jersey, um, uh, Kenya, the Philippines, Barcelona, Switzerland, Nigeria, Ukraine, Raleigh, and uh, somebody else from Nigeria. So please, you know, for everybody who's connected, you know, thank you so much for connecting and watching this session. And uh, uh, please let us know where you're connecting from. And throughout the interview, if you have any questions for Janelle, please let us know. And, you know, happy to, uh, you know, transfer those questions to you, Janelle. So, uh, you know, please, please let us know about more of, that, more of the research because there are some numbers in there about how this working from home thing impacts women so differently than it impacts men. And so, you know, do you wanna share some of those, uh, those numbers with us? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think uh, the, the biggest one I think is that there's this complete shift from the number of working women that were the primary caregiver for their children. Um, so pr prior to COVID, 5% of our uh, respondents were taking care of their children themselves. Like how they do that, I have no idea. I <laughs> wasn't a deep dive on that. Um, but that actually, that number has moved from 5% to 62%. So 62% of the full-time working, or excuse me, part-time and full-time working respondents are now the primary caregiver to their children. So this means that they're either the full-time nanny, um, you know, or daycare provider, or in uh, many cases, um, also the teacher. So they're also educating their child during distance learning. Um, and, and I think the next question is, well, you know, the ones with partners, husbands, or, or partners in general, well, are they stepping up and helping? Um, well, what we found was that, um, all, that there was an uptick from 1% to 9%. So the delta there is 8%, right? So we're not seeing that um, huge, let's say, uh, jump in also partners helping, even though they potentially are impacted at work as well. So I think that's that can be a bit shocking, and, it, and there's a whole school of thought, and there's many experts on how to negotiate um, kind of the in-home dynamics of childcare, of housework, and so forth. And there's a lot of literature on that even before coronavirus. Um, so I think that's just something that you know I came at it to 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 see really from a corporation's perspective. If a corporation comes in with a response to say, well, you know, the partners are at home as well. Well, I think the, the bottom line is, is that we're not seeing a, a proportionate increase from that perspective. Now, what do you think that means for, for the, for the, for the corp, from the corporate perspective? What things can change short term? Because, you know, one, one thing that happens with this crisis is that we don't have an idea of when it's going to end. We don't know if it's going to end next week. Uh, we don't know if it's going to end in a month from now. We don't know what reopening the economy means because everybody's working. Everybody's trying to work. I mean, differently, of course, uh, you know, but everybody's trying to do something. So it's not that the economy is shut down. It's, I mean, the restaurants are shut down, unfortunately. But what does this mean short term 
for corporations knowing that if they have uh, either you know women in leadership positions or just female workers right and they are either single parents or they have kids their reality at home is is very different from the reality that they were used to seeing from that women at work in the office right so what does this mean in the short term from from the corporation perspective what should they do to be more mindful about the fact that this reality has dramatically changed over the past month because of coronavirus? Yeah, so I think that um, you're absolutely spot on. Um, so I, I actually have a quote that I wanted to kind of call attention before I address that question uh, um, immediately because I think that it's very relevant. So one of the uh, respondents wrote that people without young kids are working like crazy and making people juggling kids and working from home look bad in comparison. Yeah. Yes. So what's happening is that because the coronavirus is doing the isolation at home and you're either alone or maybe with a partner, um, the individuals that are without children or with children out of the house can have the longer hours. So their productivity is actually going up. And the, the women and, and parents, I don't want to fully exclude those that are the, the men that are taking the lead on this, are now during the work hours doing distance learning, right? Especially mm -hmm. with folks in, in um, home or being um, a daycare provider for a child under six, five or six, depending on where you live in the world. And what this looks like is distance learning isn't put your child in front of a computer and they learn right? It's, it's very hands-on. Um, depending on the age of your child, you know, you would think that maybe the older they get, the, the more you could just put it in front of the computer, let the teacher do their job, and then they fill out some forms. Um, actually, that's incorrect, because as they learn new content, the parent needs to actually learn it as well, mm. so that they become part of the learning journey. So if you're, um, child is connecting to their class between nine and three or you know eight and two whenever the schedule happens to be well those are prime working hours as well so the parents are not only trying to answer emails be on zoom calls that are now you know very much video they're trying to manage their child or children's learning yeah for the children under five their attention span is quite low. So you can't just put a block in front of them or some toys and they're gonna play with this, right? They are wanting snacks every 90 minutes. Their nap, they get up from their nap. <laughs> so I think what you're seeing is the multitasking uh, makes it very difficult for um, these individuals to concentrate. Um, and what we could be seeing from corporations um, I think that is the opting out. So I did hear from some of the respondents that they want to opt out of working. So when you, wow. we already see women opting out at the critical times of having their children. Now coronavirus is re-bringing that up. If we have to go into the opting out decision around uh, compensation, that comes into play the, the kind of equal pay challenges that we have um, here in the U.S. and globally. Um, so if you're comparing salary levels and we know that, you know, depending on the type of woman you are in the U.S., it can be anywhere between 80 some odd cents and 70 some odd cents of a pay differential compared to a white male, um, you know, you're going to probably opt out more likely if you're the woman than you're the man. And so that's a decrease of pipeline, which for me, um, you know, as a, someone who's highly focused on the C-suite and board level, um, succession plans and ensuring that women are making it to the highest levels, this could propose a huge challenge for us in the next three to five years. That, that is, uh, I mean, that reality is heartbreaking in the sense that if we measure performance and productivity after this crisis or during this crisis, the same way we always do it, then we're going to be making a huge uh, disservice and probably discrimination against, I don't have kids, so you're right. You know, my hours are my hours, so I can do whatever I want with my hours as opposed to a parent who, have to, who has to also do work and take care of kids. So, I, you know, I think, ha have, you, have you come across a new idea or an idea on how to measure productivity, if that even makes sense, 
to measure productivity during this during this time, if it even makes sense to do performance reviews. I think you and I talked about this and you know, with some other folks, they are saying we have to get rid of performance reviews this year because it's going to be incredibly unfair with the people who have to do 1,000 jobs at home beyond their day-to-day -day work that they were just doing at, uh, in the office when we were, you know, in the period before coronavirus. So have you come with any uh, way to measure or to ensure that people are actually doing the work without putting a burden on them uh, with, the, with the traditional indicators of productivity and performance? Yeah, I mean, I think you and I did talk about the performance review process, right? And yeah. I think if there was ever a time to, to make the case to test and learn around removing that, this would probably be it. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that, um, you know, there's but there is the reality of the situation is, is is that a lot of our compensation programs are tied to these performance review uh, processes, right? So um, in the case that corporations have tied performance and compensation together very linearly, um, the the question that I, or let's say the, the part that I start to really focus in on is, um, you know, how does the calibration process work? Um, and how are you considering the disproportionate impact on some of your communities around the coronavirus and your employees, right? So when you go through a calibration process of a highly large organization like the one that I worked with, we would cut the data several dis different ways to understand how the calibration curve was applying um, to the different populations, so men, women, ages, location, um, number of, you know, how far away they were from the CEO. I think this is a time that we would want to look at how is the calibration curve um, shaping up against non-parents and parents and mm -hmm. using your PIPA data to do, to do that prior to solidifying any sort of um, uh, rating system. Again, yeah. that's if they choose to keep it. Um, I'm, I'm probably more in your camp that I think today, you know, now is the time to kind of remove that. Um, and, and remove that burden and that stress because I think that there's already um, muscle memory when you've had children and you've left the workplace for, you know, six, eight, 12, you know, weeks or even a year, depending again on where you are in the world, uh, coming back to your job and will, will you even have one? So this time, I think, just continues to reinforce the fears of, uh, of that. And so I would definitely recommend um, adjusting expectations. I think another thing around the expectations is um, having visible senior leadership talk about um, the new way of working is really important. Yes. Um, so when you have a senior leader that is having a Zoom, let's say like you and I talking to the masses and a child is, is present, that helps set the tone for that organization and the embarrassment or the pressure to try to keep the children out of screen goes away. Yeah. Right. So these type of little things of redefining how the, the expectations of work, I think, are also helpful. That is fantastic. And actually, when when you know the the, the coronavirus crisis in the United States uh, sort of burst around the beginning of March, and you know everybody was sent to work from home and whatnot. So people were asking me, you know, what do you recommend us to do? You know, in our in our roadmap now that we are going to be working from home. And one of the things that I said was, you have to ensure that your leaders convey the message that they are also human and they don't have all the answers. And what this means is that it is okay for them not to know how to use Zoom, for example. It is okay for them to have a cat jumping over their desk when they are in a call. That is totally fine. Or have a dog barking in the background. That is okay because that is human, right? If, if they didn't do that, like you're saying, they are sending the message to people that they have to strive for perfection and not for humanity as we're going through this crisis. And I think these concepts are diametrically opposed right now. If you try to be perfect in the way you are conducting your business and your work right now, you're gonna be going unhuman or inhuman because you are dealing with a lot of things at home, whether you are a parent, a single parent, somebody who is just dedicated to work. I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, it's not just the fact that you have to take care of all these things, but you also have to take, make sure that you're healthy and safe and that you're following all the, you know, the safety protocols that have been put, put, put out there. So it is a lot to deal with and leaders have to acknowledge that perfection right now 
or, or looking for perfection right now, it is a big mistake and it is sending the wrong message. And I, you know, I, I, I celebrate what you're saying when, when business leaders can come to a Zoom call being a human, being a person, you know, wearing a sweatshirt and, you know, having their, their, their kids around, that sends the message of it is okay. You know, this is, this is what we are, you know, doing right now. And we're working while we're doing this. And it is, it is our life today. It may not be that way in six months from now, but this is the way it is. So that's, that's super important. But I, I want to play a little bit of devil's advocate here, right? Uh, because I know sometimes if you're a business leader, you can be very human. You can be, you know, caring, understanding, empathetic, but you also have to make sure that you are bringing the revenue that you need in your organization to keep the, those people employed. So how do you tell them, hey, you know, these, your employees are dealing with a lot of things at home, but they are also working. It may sound a little bit anecdotal to tell them, uh, you know, they are, they're working and, you know, we think they're working. How can you tell them, okay, they're working and these are the two or three things or three ways in which you know that they are actually being you know, productive given the circumstances. I'm not saying measuring productivity as before, but they are doing their job given the circumstances. Yeah, so um, so I think if we look at the, the, the respondents, um, and I would tell the, you know, every executive that will listen, um, not a single, let's say, I didn't see any indication that um, these parents were looking to not do their job mm -hmm. um, or to get paid for anything that uh, they didn't deserve, right? There's not a, a there wasn't a big sense of, of wanting to take advantage of things. Um, in fact, 44% of them said that what their company can do right now is offer flexibility. Mm -hmm. So I think that if, depending on where your company is in the kind of flex work journey, that it might be a good time, it could be a good time to look at what that means, right? So flexible working oftentimes is targeted as, oh, you work from home, that's flexible, the place. Yeah. But right now we need to be looking at the how and when as well. So how are you working? When are you working? And I believe that most people when given the flexibility to take their 24 hours, will will absolutely focus on what needs to get done for the business especially now when they the, when there's a big fear of of job loss they're not looking to you know skate by or be invisible they're looking to keep their job and they want to be able to to manage it all so how and where excuse me how when and where becomes the key. So as HR professionals, many of us own this, right? Or this tends to fall into the bucket of HR, um, the kind of flexible working policy. So can we look at our policy? Is it clearly stating and providing examples around the uh, when, where, and how? And if it is or is not, you know, adjusting that and then reinforcing those messages to individuals right and having that communication of look no one's looking for a free ride here right yeah. they're not i mean maybe maybe there is but that's not how we drive policy right we drive policy for the people that are looking to do the right thing yeah so i would say assume positive intent create an environment where people can work flexibly and that means the how and the when um and um let you know people have these conversations uh, one of the things that also comes, comes to mind when I think through this, um, you know, talking to my colleagues in HR is around this unconscious bias trainings as well. Um, because during this time, we're already seeing in the media a lot of pitting of against different generations. Mm -hmm. Now, with gender, we've got ethnicity challenges, right? So there, we're seeing that coronavirus is impacting all these groups disproportionately um, and, and in ways that is quite disturbing, I think. Yeah. I think that's what keeps me up at night. Um, so, you know, making sure that we reprime the, the, the organization to understand that we're going to be coming to work with biases and are we prepared to understand how those may translate in the workplace, right? Not making assumptions just because I have three kids and I'm working full time that I can't take something on. Yeah. Ask me, right? Yeah. Or being the mother of three and I can't take something on being able to have that conversation with my teammates to say, I, I need help, 
right? I'm, it's not that I don't want to work. It's that I'm really struggling because you're putting six hours of Zoom meetings during my kid's school. Can we yeah. please do it either a little bit later or do it a little bit earlier? I, I absolutely love what you're saying. And I love what you're saying because the reality is that people were used to come to work, parents, I'm not a parent, but I have colleagues who are parents and they come to work at the time that they have to come to work. Sometimes they are obliged to come to work at some time, but the entire you know, life system was designed to make that happen. You know, you go to drop off your school, your kids in school at 8 or 9 a.m. You come to work at 9.30. You leave at, you know, 4 or 5 p.m. Somebody picks up the kid in school or you, you, you pick him up, whatever it is. So the system is disrupted right now. So nothing in that system is working in the way it was supposed to work before. So forcing people to work in the same way they were working before, but now online is a huge mistake. You can't just transfer the in-person reality of life and work to the online in-person reality of life and work during coronavirus. Because what that would mean is that now you, Janelle, have to join a call at 9 a.m. And maybe it is at 9 a.m. when you're connecting your kids to their teacher's Zoom call for their classes. And then you're like, well, you know, at 9 a.m. I can't. I know that I used to come to work at 9 a.m., but the school is closed and my teacher is just connecting people at 9 a.m. So we can transfer those things that, you know, that linearly, so to speak. There's got to be some redesign in there. And one thing that I've been talking about for ever since this crisis started uh, here in, in the United States is uh, that we don't have neither the mindset to cope with all these traumatic changes and we have to cultivate that new mindset. But more importantly, we don't have the infrastructure to make this, this work. And when I say the infrastructure, you mentioned one very important thing that HR does, which is policy. Our policies are not designed to cope with this reality. And we have to redesign them to allow for, for, some, for certain you know, uh, processes and some standards in the, in the way we're operating. But we also have to redesign, the, redesign them in a way that allows for a lot of flexibility because mm-hmm. we don't know the reality of each of our workers in their, in their, in their homes, what they're dealing with and, and, and whatnot. And then one thing else that, so it's, you know, when it comes to schedule and transferring the in-person world to the online world, we got to rethink, uh, you know, how, how we do it. One thing that you also mentioned was how, how we're going to be driving and designing corporate policy moving forward. And you mentioned something that unfortunately has been, I think has been the, the you know, the most common case, which is, people designing policy based on the worst case scenario instead yeah. of the in, instead of the of the of the mean right of the of the of the of the more normal scenario so you may have you know 1000 employees and maybe you know 10 of them are not really working they are just like hanging out all day and they're not doing the work you won't design a policy for 1000 employees based on the performance of these 10 people you will design based on the performance of most people who are really committed to doing their work these days so this is a very important message that you're sending to HR, which is you got to be flexible in your policy design, but you also got to acknowledge the people who are really committed to doing their work and not necessarily the, you know, the outliers that are maybe either high performers that, you know, they do it, their work differently or the ones who don't want to work at all and they are taking advantage and they are the free riders. So I think this is fascinating and this is very short and long-term thinking, right? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I think there's a, there, this is, Look, we don't know the new normal at this point. I think that we can all kind of scenario play this forward, but I think that fundamentally, and you and I have spoken about this, who we are as people has changed, right? And so as organizations, because they're made up of people, the question will be is, uh, or let's say the, the imperative will be the leaders of these corporations need to change as well. This kind of I loved what you had said about the not being perfect earlier, and and yet there's so often that excellence is part of a value of a corporation. Yeah. So just if you think about that word in a value-driven way, um, you know, is that even appropriate anymore? Is excellence the right strive anymore? Right. Yeah. Uh, you know. And so I think yeah, you're right. We have to be looking forward. We have to understand well, what's the new normal and how do we evolve our corporations quickly so yeah. that they don't become too far behind? Yeah, and I, I love the, the, the concept of excellence. And there are many other concepts, of course, associated with the traditional way of working. 
and some of them may not apply anymore. Uh, and like, for example, is, is, it, is it the right time now to be, for example, working on innovation rather than just, you know, operating the company day by day to make sure that it survives this crisis, right? Is it, you know, are you going to be putting resources in innovation? So maybe your innov- in innovative thinking, your creative thinking is changing in the way you implement it in the organization because, well, we're going through a crisis and through a crisis, people want to have the most amount of stability possible to, be, to make sure that they survive uh, mm-hmm. uh, through the crisis. So we have to rethink all of these concepts. And of course, the expectation is that, that we make them sustainable that the things that we're going through right now that are actually working, we can make them sustainable in time. I I posted something on my LinkedIn a a while ago saying that I'm going to smack anybody who says that women cannot be promoted or have leadership positions because they they can't uh, be trusted because they also have to take care of family. When right now we're seeing old parents, single parents, moms taking care of all the things and making everything work. So I hope that you know, think, you know, thoughts like this continue over time, even beyond the, uh, you know, the coronavirus crisis. So, so maybe, you know, I have a couple, last couple of questions for you. One of them is, what do you think will, will change after the crisis? And what do you think will stay the same? Uh, you know, like, I know this is a, you know, sort of a, a, a long shot in terms of forecasting what could potentially happen, but do you have any, any, feelings of uh, and based on data or gut feeling about what could change work-wise, organizational-wise, and what could stay the same. And the, how to make, the second question is how to make the things that have worked during this crisis sustainable in time. Mm. Yeah, so I think <clears throat> this is a very interesting question. So I think that, so on a daily, on a daily basis, right, as an activist investor, I'm really focused on um, getting and, and pushing the idea of the stakeholder versus the shareholder alone. Um, and I think that, you know, as you look at large corporations that are publicly traded, and I'm going to go in that space right now globally, um, there's still a huge thought that the number one priority is the shareholder. Hmm. And I believe that this crisis has proven that incorrect. Yep. Stakeholder the stakeholders, which are, uh, you know, your employees, the community, the world, and the shareholder, um, you know, depending on who you are, how you twist that, or how you kind of frame that up, the stakeholder model is really what I think is a, is the at the forefront in the future. Um, this is something that, um, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the WEF has already started. I shared that on my LinkedIn saying, look, we're recommitting, we're accelerating the idea that it's not shareholder only, it's now stakeholder. So I think that that's something that will come forward and it will um, um, accentuate because I believe, um, and we're actually crunching numbers right now around the gender equity to see how performance is, how the stock performed over um, March comparatively to their non-gender diverse com- corporations. Um, I believe that we will see corporations that are socially conscious, that are um, diversity friendly and inclusion focused, performing better in the long run. Because these are companies that value, um, let's say, more holistically um, the things that are important, right? Mm -hmm. So when push push comes to shove, your family um, is important to you. And if you can you can feel like what's important to you is important to your corporation, you're going to add more value and do better. Um, so I think that that's, that's the first, um, what was the second question? <laughs> I'm how, sorry. Th- th- that's all right. The second question was how to make the things that work today sustainable in time. Though I want to ask one comment to what you said, which is, I think that many companies are doing, are genuinely and authentically doing the right thing today because they know that they are, they have to do it for the benefit of the greater, you know, good and society. And those companies will be remembered and taken into account for doing the right thing. But there are companies doing the wrong thing. There are retail brick and mortar shops, and I'm not going to name any, but there's one that has forced their employees to come to work as an essential business when they are not essential business. And people will remember that. And I'm hoping, I mean, nobody wants anybody to see somebody else fail, but I am hoping that people remember these things because we have to learn the lesson right? We can't just allow, you know, people being put into a, into a position of taking risk, health risk, and then being left alone if they, if by any chance they get, chance they get sick. So, so, you know, going along the lines of what you're saying, 
the concept of you know of uh, stakeholders is yeah your you know your employees your community your shareholders, your shareholders but those stakeholders will remember you know who was with them during the crisis who did the right thing during the crisis and who didn't and I am hoping that we as the stakeholders we take action accordingly. Anyway, just wanted to add that comment in there. And the last question that I wanted to ask you is how do we make the things, the positive things that we have learned and made work over the past three or four weeks during this crisis, how do we make them sustainable even when the crisis is gone? For example, working from home. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> so, I th so I think that I think that you're already seeing in these like highly financial um, centric journals, you know, like the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, CEOs are looking at their real estate footprint and realizing that there's a business case and it's feasible to send people home, right? So I think that the, again, this is where the start of our conversation is the data. Right. Yeah. So where do where do corporations and where do CEOs like to see things happen? The bottom line or the top line? So if you can show um, decreased cost, right, around the real estate footprint, I think you'll see people go home. Um, I think the other thing is there around the productivity, right? So I think that I would be really interested. I think in in seeing data around productivity of employees from working from home versus mm -hmm. before, because we know all those micro moments and the kind of water cooler talk um, add up to a lot of hours of wasted time within a day, yeah. right? So people that are working and in the commute. Office, yeah, exactly. They've got their eight hours. They've got an hour. If you're in LA, you know, I'm in Los Angeles. People are an hour usually each way. So their 10 hours has now become eight hours. And in those, you know, instead of 10 hours, maybe they're even working 10 hours because their commutes just, you know, grab their cup of coffee. Um, so I would be interested to see over the bigger population <clears throat> kind of taking the averages if productivity hasn't gone up. Yeah. Um, but, but again, that's not something that I, I've seen any data on. Um, so I think that that's it. And I, and I would say the, the other thing that's a little bit less hard or more of a soft quality is I hope that um, the kind of empathy leadership that, that you mentioned um, and the humanity of people, I, I hope that this brings that um, to a new level. I yeah. hope that's, that these kind of images of corporate success start to change um, the perfect button up, you know, Armani suit isn't the pinnacle of success anymore. Um, you know, it's something much more human than, than that and much more attainable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I know there's a lot of tragedy going on out there and, you know, people suffering from their safety and health perspective, but also financially. I think one of the silver lining linings of this crisis for everybody is, to see it as a wake up, wake up call for humanity, because the way we have done things, as you know, before the crisis, were not working, and many people have been saying that it's just that we didn't pay enough attention. Like for example, uh, you know, here in the United States, 10 million people lost their jobs in two weeks. Many more million will be added this week, and all of them are without health insurance now. I mean, that can happen anymore. And I'm not making a political statement here. I'm just saying we have to rethink uh, the infrastructure that we put in place. Right, because we are so gridlocked in in traditional views of the world that there's a, a you know, and we're making policy for those extremes that the large overwhelming majority of everybody else, everybody else's thoughts in the middle is being neglected, and we gotta rethink about all these things. We gotta bring and make sure that we celebrate and champion the empathetic leaders, the ones that they care about the longevity of an organization, but they also care about their people. I, you know, I have one great example, which you know, I'm, I'm a fan of him, uh, Dan Price in Gravity Payments. He, uh, he was making a million dollars as a CEO of his company. He cut his, he cut his salary to $70,000 so that he was able to raise everybody else to $70,000. Of course, this came with a lot of backlash, including from inside the company, but it's proven work. And now the company is so integrated and so empowered that they themselves decided to cut everybody, to cut them their own uh, salaries by 20% to 
to avoid laying people off during the crisis or increasing prices for their customers. So that kind of leadership, which can has the, the, the ability, the, the, the transparency, the caring, and the, the love to come to the company and say, you know, we're all going through this together and we're all going to suffer in one way or another. What do we want to do? How do we want to do it? What can we decide together? I am hoping that we see more of that. Now we are, I don't know if you remember last year, the, the business roundtable, you know, the, the most powerful companies talking about purpose at work. Now it is a time for them to prove that it was not just blah, blah, that it is real talk. And, and I know a lot of them will have to lay off people because there's no way around this. And, and we understand that. But if they come from a place of caring, if they come from a place of transparency, if they come from a place of love, I think people will be able to sort of swallow that differently than if they, were, if they are coming from a place of, for example, uh, you know, we, we saw some companies having their CEOs getting a pay, a pay a bump uh, a, or, or bonus bump and then people being laid off during the, during the crisis. Or when people get a, an email saying, thank you for your service, Janelle, but you know, we can no longer have you anymore in this, in this company. Goodbye. Those kind of things are not, should not be tolerated anymore. And anyway, you know, like you're saying, this, this is a great opportunity for us to do things differently. And hopefully we, we do that going forward. So mm -hmm. Janelle, it was a great conversation, very enlightening, you know, to know about the data that you have collected, all, all the ideas for the future. And I hope we can, you know, help and, and contribute to make them uh, achievable and real as we go through this crisis and into the future. Yeah, thank you so much. And I think that if there's any of your um, constituencies, your listeners or watchers that want to have access to the study, it's available for um, everyone to download. So it's not something that I'm, um, you know, holding on to. And I'm happy to provide you with the link so that people can can, can get that. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Chanel. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, today at, at 10 a.m., I'm going to have another, at 10 a.m. Pacific time, I'm going to have another LinkedIn Live about unlearning and relearning during this crisis. So, you know, all conversations, trying to, you know, bring people up and help them be more positive, even in the middle of all this crisis. Thank you, Janelle, and I hope you stay safe and strong. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.